Welcome back, everyone. We now begin our final committee of the afternoon, which is Committee of the Whole. We have, I believe, five items before us today. The first one is an overview of CenturyLink's application for cable television franchise. Many people know uh, CenturyLink for their internet services. This is a cable television franchise we're talking about. Um, cable, uh, sorry, CenturyLink came forward back in June of 2016. Negotiations have taken place over the past year based on community needs and interests that were identified in a community's needs assessment and based on staff interaction with the public related to cable television interests and based on policy direction and guidance provided from the Council Franchise Working Group and from the Mayor's Office. It's important to note that CenturyLink as a second cable television provider in the community is not required to meet the same standards as the incumbent cable television provider per Federal Communications uh, Commission regulations. Uh, today, staff will provide an overview of the franchise agreement and will highlight key policy and community interests. CenturyLink representatives are here and will be present to answer any council questions. If you have any, a vote is requested following a public hearing tonight. So this evening, we will have a public hearing on this same issue. This afternoon's a briefing, but no vote is expected right now. Um, our IT director, Ms. Marty Mulholland, is here. Good afternoon, Council. I'd also like to introduce James Erb, who's a senior attorney and the other half of the staff team working on this project. I'll also take a moment to introduce the representatives from CenturyLink. Mr. Tory Summers is there. He is with the Franchising and Legal Affairs uh, part of CenturyLink. We also have David Namura. David is the director of local, state and local government affairs. And we also have Mr. Brian Hershey, who's a locally based employee. He's a supervisor of regional operations. So um, we'll also introduce our council working group. Um, April Barker and Jean Knudsen met with us um, during the course of this project. <laughs> So um, just briefly, we'll walk through some franchise basics, the, the process we use to develop the agreement, and highlight the key elements of interest in the proposed agreement. James will present the impacts related to municipal code, and then we'll uh, wrap up and take your questions. So what is a franchise agreement? It is a contract between the city and a cable television operator. And like most contracts, it has terms and conditions uh, based on their potential use of our city right away to provide these cable television services. There are also financial obligations, which we'll highlight in a subsequent slide. These agreements contain some provisions that are of interest to the community, such as uh, customer service, uh, discount programs, closed captioning and reporting. Um, the cable operators are often in these agreements required to make channels available for non-commercial programming. So we call those PEG channels, and PEG stands for Public Education and Government Access Television. Again, that's non-commercial programming. And I think the council is well aware we have one such channel in our community, which is BTV Bellingham, which we, the city, operate. And it is a full PEG channel. So uh, we provide the public access programming on Sunday nights and the education and government access programming the remainder of the week. The agreement also includes technical specifications and enforce enforcement provisions. And uh, some language that we may use here uh, does refer to Comcast as the city's incumbent provider. And Comcast provides cable television throughout the Bellingham community, whereas CenturyLink would be our second entrant or our second cable television provider. And therefore, some of the franchise provisions are different, and that's what we'll be highlighting here today. So another uh, franchise basic, uh, people might say, in this agreement, do you regulate the rates that the cable TV company uh, can charge? And the answer is no. Uh, our ability to regulate um, rates is limited by federal law, and in practicality, it's not something we can or have done. So no, we don't con control the rates in these agreements. These agreements largely contain the other provisions that I described just a moment ago. We also do not have the ability to regulate other services provided by these companies, such as internet and telephone. Sometimes those are of interest, but this agreement is focused solely on cable television. 
So if we have a second provider in the community, what are the impacts? Um, first, and maybe the most significant, is that the service will not be available to every single address in the community. Um, and we'll be talking about that further, but that's, that's a key difference. Um, another key difference is some of those other franchise requirements will be phased in over time depending on the market share. So currently our incumbent operator serves about 20,000 addresses, just over 20,000 addresses. So if CenturyLink, uh, if this agreement moves forward and they begin offering their services, they have to get a certain percentage of the total market before those provisions would, would kick in. It would provide an additional cable television choice um, in the community for those residents who could receive the service based on their address. Um, and we are unclear on the fiscal impacts to the city uh, simply because the fiscal impacts to the city depend on adoption and the rates charged by the operators. So we just really don't know what, what this will mean in terms of city revenue. Spending just a minute on the development process, um, CenturyLink did reach out to us back in March of 2016, asked about the cable application process. A few months later in June, they did submit the application um, and then we did spend about a year in negotiations uh, with the council work group, the mayor's office, and our staff team. Um, also mentioned in the summary statement of the agenda that we used the past community needs report, which was um, put together when we went through a fairly robust public process in our renewal with our incumbent. Um, we obviously used the existing franchise agreement that resulted uh, from that renewal effort. We felt as a staff we had a fair amount of experience with cable interests because we've um, been doing it for a while. We reached out to some of the other jurisdictions that have received, um, that have entered into these franchises with CenturyLink and, and the guidance from the working group and mayor's office. I'll just mention uh, as a little bit of context that, that um, CenturyLink, we, we're not the first city in either the state or the country. Um, the name of CenturyLink's television service is PRISM. They have agreements with several other cities in Washington, including Seattle and Bellevue, and then a number of other small jurisdictions, Burien, Lake Forest Park, Normandy Park, Shoreline, and just within the past month, city of Mercer Island. And they have about 300,000 customers in the United States. So walking through some of the most key issues in this uh, franchise that you would want to be aware of. First is the term of the agreement. This is a 10-year agreement. However, CenturyLink has the ability to terminate if at the five-year mark they have not achieved a 20% market share. Our incumbent agreement is a 10-year agreement. So there's a similarity but an opt-out uh, for CenturyLink in this agreement. The financial provisions are largely identical to those in our incumbent agreement. The franchise fee rate is 5%. Um, that's what um, a cable operator pays to the city. Um, it's based on their revenue. So 5% of the revenue that they earn for their use of our right of way, they pay to the city. This is identical and pretty similar throughout the entire state. I only know of one exception, um, which is Whatcom County. Um, we have a peg fee of 50 cents per subscriber per month that is also uh, the same as in our incumbent agreement and monthly payment and reporting requirements also the same as in our incumbent agreement. So I want to spend a minute on service availability because this is the key issue. Um, in this agreement, CenturyLink is able to provide service to an address based on their technical infrastructure. So. If the address can meet CenturyLink's technical requirements, then it can be served. CenturyLink has put into this agreement that they anticipate being able to serve 6,200 addresses in the community within the first year. So again, we, we currently have 20,000 subscribers. And um, we sort of asked the question for our community members who might be watching this, wow, will, will I be able to get the service? How will I know? 
Um, the answer is uh, CenturyLink would make that information available about 30 days after this franchise was agreed upon. And so a resident could look up an address on, or a resident could look up their address on the website or call CenturyLink to determine if they could get this cable service called PRISM. When you have this kind of discussion, it's important to mention, I think, these next two sentences that are in the franchise. CenturyLink cannot deny service to any group based on race or income levels, and they can't base their decisions about construction based upon race or income levels. So those are f formally written into this agreement as we look at a, a service that's not provided um, to the same population as our incumbent agreement. The PEG channel provisions are very, very similar to our incumbent agreement. Um, BTV Bellingham will be aired in standard definition. It will be aired in high definition. Um, the third channel provision is slightly different from our incumbent agreement. It could be requested if CenturyLink reaches a 30% market share. Um, there's another difference in the way that uh, CenturyLink's system works in that people using that service would be able to see PEG channels from other communities in Washington State as well. So for example, you might be able to watch the Seattle uh, government channel or the Mercer Island government channel um, on their system. That's, that's a bit of a unique um, element to the way their service works. The franchise offers a robust number of low-income discounts, and I believe we put those programs, uh, we identified those programs in the staff report. Both agreements require closed captioning, so that's not really a difference, but just wanted to mention that that is required. Uh, some of the reporting requirements are phased in based on market share. And finally, uh, customer service locations, uh, there is a difference in this agreement. Initially, CenturyLink will offer payment locations in the greater Bellingham area, but upon reaching 30% of the market share, they would offer a more robust customer service location. So that's another key uh, difference in this agreement um, that would affect the community. I'm gonna turn it over to James to speak to the code impacts. Good afternoon, everyone. There are um, just a couple of things I want to highlight with respect to the municipal code. We actually have a chapter that we previously adopted that, re that speaks to local regulation of cable television. It's uh, BMC Chapter 617. Um, and it has kind of, the, it sets the floor in terms of what we expect of cable operators within the community and the things that we, um, that we will ask them to do in terms of local regulation. It has not been updated terribly frequently over the years, as you may imagine. Um, we've only had one cable operator for many years, and so we've not had the need to do that. And regrettably, some of those code provisions um, have been preempted by changes in federal law. So one of the most important things to note is that the way the code is written, any cable operator within the city has to provide service throughout the city. Um, and any person who wants service uh, throughout the city is typically able to contact the incumbent provider and get service. And if they're within a, located within a certain amount of uh, distance to the infrastructure that's in place, they're allowed to get service at a standard installation rate. Um, and that's the way the code is written. So it's been written for decades, I believe. Um, with the new entrant, which is what CenturyLink would be, those provisions would not apply. So as Marty talked about during her presentation, CenturyLink will be able to <laughs> offer service to qualified living units where they have infrastructure in place. They provide cable television in a completely different way than the incumbent provider. Um, they provide cable te television through fiber optic uh, cable, not through traditional coaxial cable. So they don't have fiber throughout the city currently. Uh, they have installed fiber throughout parts of the city, and that's why they estimate that they'd be able to offer the service to, I think, about 6,200 QLUs uh, upon adoption of this franchise agreement. 
And so one of the things uh, to keep in mind is that the Federal Communications Commission, which regulates cable service at the federal level, um, has indicated to cities like us, local franchising authorities, that we cannot have unreasonable barriers to competition. And one of those things would be like unreasonable build-out requirements. So we cannot, as a condition of granting a franchise to CenturyLink, saying, yes, we'll give you the franchise, but only if you agree to construct fiber throughout every you know, road, alley, byway, throughway, tunnel, bridge, whatever, across the city, right? Like that would be unreasonable uh, according to the federal government. And uh, so we're not going to, we're not doing that. We have not asked CenturyLink to do that. They have not agreed to do that. So that is uh, the most important distinction between this franchise uh, and the existing franchise for the incumbent operator. There are some other ones that are related. Um, based on market share, we've allowed CenturyLink to phase in some requirements. There are some reporting requirements that they've asked to phase in, uh, depending on when they um, approach a certain level of market <laughs> share. Uh, there's also, as Marty mentioned, the local customer service office. It's very expensive um, to have a local customer service office for Comcast. Uh, CenturyLink, by contrast, has zero cable subscribers in the community. So at this point, they're asking not to have a local office and to be able to provide a more robust local office once they've reached a certain market share, uh, which we've agreed to uh, tentatively in the negotiations. And so those are the main um, differences. And what I've termed them in the staff report is kind of waivers of our code requirements rather than going in and changing the cable code in all the discrete areas where it mentions these things, because there are several. And I could take a lot of your time by going through them line by line. Um, what we're saying is we just want to waive those requirements and say that if you do approve the application for a CenturyLink's franchise, then implicitly you will have agreed to waive those requirements as far as CenturyLink is concerned. Does anyone have any questions about that? No? Does anyone want to hear all of the subsections that would be implicated? <laughs> okay. Say goodbye, James. <laughs> Bye, James. <laughs> All right, then, uh, materials are available on the city's website, including the staff report and the proposed franchise. Um, if the council acts to approve this, when would it go into effect? It would be about, it would be 15 days following the council's final action, assuming both parties signed it in 60 days. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to the council for questions and discussion and the representatives from CenturyLink are also available to answer your questions. Okay, bring it back to the council. Dan Hamill. I'm trying to understand how the um, um, the northern part of Bellingham would be served or not served by this company, um, how it would work in terms of infrastructure in the ground or not in the ground. Um, I don't know if there's anyone that can answer that question. <laughs> Yes, Tori Summers with CenturyLink. Um, and I'll answer your question in one minute. I just would like to take a minute to thank Marty and James. I really appreciate all the work they have put into this. Um, it's been about a year in the making, and I really appreciate the city and Marty and James recognizing us coming in as a second entrant uh, and the differences of that. And I think this agreement fairly uh, recognizes uh, coming in as a second entrant with zero customers. As far as your question, Council Member, as Century indicated, there's approximately 6,200 homes we're able to serve, uh, we're, we're hoping within the first 12 months, and hopefully sooner than that. The specific locations are, we don't publicly disclose right now, because it's obviously uh, confidential, because part of our concern, and we have seen elsewhere, is other companies going out there and quickly trying to lock people into long-term contracts. Uh, 6,200 homes, uh, we believe, is fairly significant. And we expand based on the success in the market. So as we are successful in the market, we will, we certainly hope to grow. Go ahead, Dan. So, so eventually is the goal to serve, to have the service area of all of Bellingham? Is that the goal? The long-term goal, yes. We want to be successful in the market. We, starting out with zero customers, we can't sit here and say we will serve the entire city within five years, within ten years, because we just simply don't know. As a second entrant with zero customers right now, it is our goal to expand as we're successful. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
I don't have any uh, comments, I mean, sorry, any questions, but uh, I did want to say I really appreciate that we're having choices for our residents. I think that's very important to our community. Um, and also, I did meet with uh, CenturyLink to kind of ask more questions because franchises are really complicated. Um, and I just wanted to pass on some feedback that the staff works with many municipalities and they were very, very complimentary, Marty, about you and your team and James' work and that they have a breadth of this experience mm -hmm. and that it was very pleasant and you were extremely knowledgeable and efficient and did a fantastic job. So thank you for, I just want to thank, thank you for you. that. Thank you. Roxanne? I've been a CenturyLink internet customer, I think, for seven years. So I have known what PRISM is for a long time. And I have been so anxiously awaiting anything like this with the hope that it might come to our area, not thinking that it ever would for another decade because we're such a smaller com community compared to other sizes of communities. So I'm willing to wait however long I need to to get this service. And I just thank you for being interested in our community. And thank you for being a customer, and, and we appreciate that feedback. <laughs> Gene? Yeah, I want to thank Marty and James for working hard on this and CenturyLink. They were, they were some pretty tough negotiations, and there was a lot of back and forth, but everybody stayed on board, and it was really great to, to work with everybody. So thanks. This will be good for Bellingham. And I have some questions that are kind of a little more technical. They have to do with the fiber return line and confidence feed, and then also something I can think called the head end. Yes. Uh, basically, my concerns are that right now the language in here refers to Bellingham Municipal Court. That's the area where we have our, our studios for BTV10. They may not be there in 10 years. I'm, I'm just wondering what kind of language is in here. There, there's language about if if. CenturyLink moves their head end, which I think if they move it, then they have to cover the costs. What if we move okay. municipal court? How does that work out? That's um, kind of you go for it. Do you want me to address? Yeah. <laughs> I, I could address it as well. Sure. That is correct. So right now, CenturyLink paid to put the the return line in the municipal court, municipal court building, and I believe it might already be, we might have already put it in there, I'm not 100% certain. We pay for that. Mm -hmm. If there is a move in the future, similar to the Comcast agreement, that language is not different from the Comcast agreement, the city would pay for a second move. Okay. Any more questions? I, I just, I wanted, I wanted to, um, you had mentioned when um, the second what did we call second entrance comes in uh, that we can't make it too difficult and just so the community understands the the repercussion of that is that they get to come in without a franchise agreement mm -hmm. so I just want to make sure that people understand we we had a kind of a bubble that we could work inside and we worked inside that bubble and I we actually pushed and extended that bubble the most that we could possibly but I just wanted to make that very clear that if we would have put those provisions in, they could have come in after a certain date. Well, there there were a couple of options available to CenturyLink if we were being, we'll just use the word unreasonable. Uh, <laughs> one option, of course, would have been for them to just walk away and say, thank you, Bellingham, for, for your interest in our service, but we're not going to come there um, with those conditions that you're asking for. Another option would have been for CenturyLink to sue us in state or federal court and allege uh, and that we were being unreasonable in the requirements that we were trying to get involved in the franchise. And if they won, then they would be able to come into the community um, with basically like a court written franchise agreement uh, that was not unreasonable, if that makes sense. But in our conversations with CenturyLink all along, they made it clear that if we weren't able to reach an agreement, they were just gonna walk away um, and everyone was gonna go their separate ways. But we, we did work within the parameters that were available to us to try to get the best possible agreement for the city. Okay, okay uh, thank you, Marty. Thank you, Tori. Uh, we thank are you. going to have a public hearing on this tonight, and we can resume the discussion at that point. We'll move on to the next item, which is the Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Behavioral Health Subcommittee Phase 3 Recommendation. The Behavioral Health Ad Hoc Subcommittee, this is a subcommittee of a uh, larger task force that was chartered by Whatcom County and the city is participating in it. Um, this ad hoc committee focused on developing and enhancing services that may avert arrest and incarceration, thus reducing the population of the jail. This effort aligned with our priority to develop or improve programs that link to the front door of the crisis triage facility. 
which is a current existing facility with, that the county hopes to expand in the future. The committee provided ongoing review and feedback on a community initiative to develop a coordinated system of response and engagement with individuals who frequently use crisis and criminal justice systems in ineffective and inappropriate ways. These individuals are the familiar faces, as we're calling them, that our community spends significant time and energy and time and money on with minimal positive impact. Uh, this initiative is called the Ground Level Response and Coordinated Engagement, or GRACE. We heard about that earlier this morning, or this afternoon. Is a, and that is a community effort encompassing the healthcare system and the criminal justice system. The GRACE project is intended in part to prevent and reduce arrest and incarceration for a targeted group of individuals by providing better coordination of interventions that connect them to treatment and support services that serve as an alternative to jail. The program is not another crisis system program to be used by anyone distressed. Instead, it is a specific program of coordinated interventions aimed at preventing unnecessary responses to individuals with high utilization of these services. Um, this agenda item was brought forward by Council Dan Hamill, who has been a leader on the Grace Project. Would you like to start or give uh, comments? I think you just stole all my thunder. I, um, I've read, <laughs> I'm sure I just read words right. you wrote, didn't I? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I, I did want to bring this forward to the um, to the council to have you all and the public to have a better understanding of the the direction that we're going. I've um, I've visited uh, and met with um, law enforcement and other members of criminal justice systems from in Spokane, uh, Everett, Seattle, and Shoreline, um, all of whom have different programs that work towards these goals of uh, working with people who use systems in inappropriate and ineffective ways. Um, the model, GRACE, uh, closely resembles Everett's CHART uh, program, Chronic High Utilizer Alternate Response Team. Um, so I've been working with a team of individuals, uh, including Tara Sundin and Mark Gardner, um, Ann Deacon from Whatcom County Health Department, Carol Gibson and Dean White from uh, uh, Whatcom Alliance on, uh, for Healthcare Ad Advancement, and Greg Winter from the Opportunity Council and Chris Phillips from Peace Health St. Joseph Amen. Medical Center. I've asked Ann Deacon and Dean White to come today to um, give us a presentation, talk to the council about uh, where we're at, where we're going, and to answer any questions council might have. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Ann Deacon, Human Services Manager for Whatcom County. And um, very briefly, uh, Whatcom County has many, and I mean the entire community, has many, many different programs to address um, prevention and reduction of incarceration, reduction of unnecessary or inappropriate visits to the hospital, police encounters, et cetera. And um, we have spent and do spend millions of dollars in this effort now and have some great outcomes. However, what we've also noticed is that there's a certain uh, group of people that do not respond well to any of these programs that we have offered right now. And these are typically people with very complex issues, both behavioral health as well as medical issues, um, often uh, high criminogenic thinking and behavior that needs to be addressed in addition to treatment services in order to be um, successfully stable and um, positive folks in our community. And so as part of our planning in terms of how do we really address this population well, we understood that we needed a really comprehensive approach that involved a team of professionals as well as community members. Uh, you've all heard the saying it takes a village to raise a child. It takes truly a village, an entire community to really support people who are very, very vulnerable, very complex with their barriers and bring them to a point of stability, recovery, and um, hopefully eventually wellness. So um, because uh, I chair the Behavior Health Ad Hoc Committee of the Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force, and Dan Hamill is my new uh, co-chair. We have um, identified in the incarceration task force the triage facility expansion as a major um, goal. 
And so what the Behavioral Health Ad Hoc Committee decided was let us focus our initial efforts on both the front door and the back door to triage facility. And what that means really is, is there a way to get people into the triage facility as opposed to into the jails or emergency departments for constant um, calls um, by the paramedics? And um, can we, once they've been in the triage facility stabilized, can we also discharge them into the community with some coordinated planning and care? obviously to include supportive housing programs. So GRACE, um, Ground Level Response and Coordinated Engagement, was really created to ensure that we address the front door. However, some of these people will go in and out of our triage facility and will also be part of that back door service. So that was our reason for beginning this effort. We knew that we had to do it with a group of folks, and so as Council Member Hamill um, identified, we had a great planning committee that put together um, two community forums. And the effort in those community forums was to bring that village together and get them all to not only understand what we were trying to do, give us input on the best way to accomplish this, and then to commit to being part of the solution. Again, um, we must have all partners fully engaged. So what is GRACE? Um, it is, and I hopefully you've got the map. So the first thing we did in the community forum is uh, hire a graphic facilitator. What we wanted, it, besides just a little bit of fun, because this is really, really hard work and sometimes um, depressing because people can be so ill, is that, oh, I'm sorry. We're going to go ahead and put it on the overhead so the uh, okay. audience can see it. Yes, that technology is beyond me, that's for sure. So our effort was really twofold. One, to have a product that every single stakeholder could take home with them, take to their offices, um, post on their office walls. Um, I'm willing to laminate it for anyone who needs a placemat. This is really an effort to have this widely distributed because we really wanted everyone to have um, a, a product to help with cohesion as well as commitment to this process. And then um, as we had these community forums, we had two. The first one, we had um, over 65 people, uh, community partners that had the authority to commit on behalf of their organizations, who had the authority to um, commit resources as well as um, efforts. And um, we took the information, did the needs assessment, did a brief overview of what we knew was um, components of a uh, successful system, which is in your packet. And then three weeks later, we reconvened this group. Again, um, everyone showed. And we said, all right, here's the product. Based on your information, based on our research, uh, and here's our vision for moving forward. We asked for feedback in terms of, okay, what have we missed? What, what do we need to address and add to this? And then how shall we move forward? Uh, we asked for commitment before people left. Who was willing? Uh, the COO of our hospital was the very first to jump up and say, I commit. And then we had everyone thereafter. Mayor Kelly was there, Chief Cook was there, uh, county representatives, uh, treatment providers, hospital, paramedics, uh, many police off, uh, chiefs throughout, including tribal police officers or tribal chiefs. So with that, um, our hope is that through uh, significant work, we're going to develop this system. And if you look at the very back, if I turn this over, will that work? We are attempting um, to create on the left an organizational structure that will have a hub. And as that map showed you, it's a hub and spoke model. The hub will have a program manager 
and um, most importantly, a software system that allows people to communicate. And those people would be the folks that are on each team. And each individual identified, and there will be a process for identifying these people who utilize frequently these crisis systems that um, usually they use them in ways that are ineffective and unhelpful, inappropriate, that each team will be identified relative to each member that's identified as a participant. Um, the team will create an intervention plan that will be a dynamic plan that can be added to on an ongoing basis and communicated through a software system that everyone on the team has access to. And then on a 24-7 basis, um, people will have access to that intervention plan. Each member of the team will be clear about what their particular role is in the response and what they're expected to do, and they've obviously already committed to it as being part of this team. And then, um, the other piece of that is that when someone is uh, comes to the light of a, a first responder, that that first responder would have access to that information as well and know what the plan is for intervention. Uh, there's questions about um, who would be, um, I'm sorry, I've got about three things going on in my head at once, so let me try to clarify here. I think the most important thing that we're trying to do with this team and hub and spoke model is to ensure that every single professional who's part of one of the spokes owns their role. What we know now is with these very complex people, one service or one service type is never adequate. And so what we find among people with these really complex issues is that they will um, rise up into the highlight of one of these agencies and they go, oh, we don't do that. We can't handle this person. And so they'll point to this person who doesn't take ownership. They'll try to um, put it off to another agency that doesn't take ownership. And unfortunately, the individual gets lost in the morass of this. So this process, the coordinated response aspect is really to ensure that there is ownership among the people on the team, everyone owns the individual's progress and health and is committed to it. So, um, how are we going to do that? We at the county uh, offered to hire a special projects manager to get this started. And obviously we um, are in the process of securing funding for some of these efforts. And with that said, I'll stop talking a minute and introduce Dean White, our special projects manager, who is also part of our planning team. And I'll let him tell you about our next steps in our timeline. Thank you, as Ann indicated, I'm the special projects manager um, for the Grace Project. Um, and I want to just basically give you an overall summary of the work that we've laid out for the next several months. Um, basically four elements to that work. Uh, and as Dan, uh, in his uh, memo to you, indicated, I think in the closing paragraph, uh, I think the, uh, the hope and the expectation is that we'll complete work on the implementation of this project uh, uh, in time to allow us to actually implement it uh, early in 2018. Uh, the first thing that was important to uh, address was the fact that there are existing services that provide some pieces of this uh, overall design, and we wanted to make sure those services were preserved while the work of developing a more complex and a more uh, robust design went forward. Uh, the city has been funding uh, an intensive case management team that takes referrals from your uh, community paramedic and from the homeless outreach team that you also fund. Um, and um, that team has been um, uh, employed by the Whatcom Alliance for Health Advancement. Uh, they are looking to step back from this, but I think there's been negotiation where they've agreed to maintain that team through uh, at least uh, October, if not the balance of the year. Uh, and so we, we have accomplished um, that task, in part uh, made possible because the county agreed to 
uh, contribute some additional funds to make that team uh, whole and keep the existing level of service. And that, I think, is in process. Um, the second area really is to begin to pull together the two, two teams that are identified in the chart uh, that you have, the leadership team for the GRACE project and a program team. Um, and we're basically building those two teams from the list of participants in the two community forums. Uh, we've identified different members of uh, those uh, forums uh, who seem like uh, uh, reasonable candidates for one or the other of those two teams. The leadership team primarily focused on issues of policy around the program and how it would operate. Uh, and the program team uh, focused really on how to operationalize the services in such a way that they're effective particularly uh, conforming to the list of uh, design principles that were also outlined in, in uh, Councilmember Hamill's uh, memo to you. Um, and so that's sort of the second area of work, is to get the work groups together to begin to flesh out uh, this program. The third area, uh, as Anne alluded to, has to do with uh, securing future funding for the program. And in that regard, um, I want to call attention to the fact that there's a, an effort now ongoing funded by the state and federal government uh, called the, account, the North Sound Accountable Communities of Health. It's part of a Medicaid demonstration program uh, or transformation project that has received substantial funds uh, from uh, the federal government for the state to administer throughout, I think it's nine regions in the state, our region being one of them, the five counties that make up the North Sound. Um, and it happens that what we're proposing in the GRACE project aligns fairly well with the objectives uh, of that demonstration, that Medicaid transformation project. And so we're hoping that we can uh, sort of concurrently with organizing our own teams and beginning to flesh out the detail um, uh, in a parallel fashion, engage in that process and make sure that opportunities that may come from that source uh, are actually available to what we're trying to do here in Whatcom County. Um, obviously, there will be consideration for other sources of funding that we're hoping the city will continue to contribute. The county, I think, will be looking at how it might contribute on an ongoing basis. We're hoping that we can uh, engage uh, uh, Peace Health to contribute because they will have uh, some benefits from making sure these folks don't uh, repeatedly use uh, hospital uh, inpatient services and so on. So that's uh, sort of the third area of work over the next several months. Uh, and the fourth really is to determine what's the right organization uh, to be kind of the hub to manage the uh, resources, the, uh, the database um, that allows us to maintain a registry of uh, these individuals um, and make sure that they're really getting uh, the services that they need and to hold the service providers accountable for their responsibility when they do, in fact, accept um, uh, responsibility for uh, taking on one of these cases. Uh, so that's a general sense of what the work is over the next several months, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Dan, do you want to say anything else before we turn the rest to the council? Um, I just uh, just a couple of quick stats. Um, if you look at the if you look at Everett's chart program, the, after their first year, they have a small amount of participants, but their, the numbers of, of jail bed days drops by over 80 percent. The number of emergency room visits drop by over, I think it's 80 percent, or it's maybe it's 75. Same thing with police contact. So I, that's what we're trying to get at is to really. Um, free up the system to have it be used for what it's systems for what they are intended for. Uh, but I just wanted to throw those numbers out. You can look up Everett chart uh, and get those numbers for yourself. Council? Pinky? I have a couple of things, so I'll start with one and see what else. Uh, quick question on the database, because I think that is probably the most critical, is everybody communicating together. Uh, one of our challenges has been that we can't get information from the actual jail on data. And I'm wondering in your conversations if this could be something that we look at with the um, county and their jail software to see if there's ways that these two softwares can talk to each other so that we have record right from incarceration to um, all the way down the road. So I'm just kind of curious if that's something that we could propose to the county around trying to get data from our facilities and overlapping those the data that we're going to be accumulating. So, you know, 
shared information um, is the holy grail mm -hmm. of uh, information systems in both healthcare and criminal justice and probably um, many other systems. Banking seems to have figured out how to do it. But um, one of the reasons that we're engaging with the regional um, accountable community health uh, process is because um, there's the possibility that there will be software available through them through what's called a pathways model um, uh, that they may be choosing and that we would then be able to avail ourselves of. The challenge is how do you then share information between different systems? And I, I won't um, pretend that that problem has been solved. Uh, to a great extent, it's going to have to be a matter of, uh, well, there's two parts of it. One is identifying who are the folks we're talking about, first of all. And that um, will be one of the pieces of work that the leadership team will be engaging in is from the different um, uh, areas, uh, law enforcement, health care, uh, behavioral health, and so on, identifying who are the common folks that we're all touching in some way that are familiar faces to us. Um, but then the second part really is once you've engaged those folks, how do you make sure that everybody who's involved knows what's going on with that person and that you don't have um, people unaware of what may be going on in terms of uh, either incarceration or treatment uh, with a person uh, that's been engaged in this project. So the operational details of that is, is one of the big issues to be resolved in the next several months. How do we make that work? Go ahead. Uh... Oh, number two. Uh, I know this is kind of getting in the weeds, but you're talking about um, the crisis triage facility and, you know, making that a stronger facility. And one of the things there is they have a community garden that they don't even use. <laughs> and uh, in regards to the um, improving the quality of life experience for those who are incarcerated currently is if we could look at have a gardening program there it gets people out of the facility and allows them to grow vegetables that could be used in our jail so i don't know if that's something you guys are discussing just want to throw that out there but there is a whole big community garden space that is empty there so um, just want to throw that out and then the lastly is this is really awesome uh, and it is fun. I just have one thing in regards to feedback is that anything that is outside of the circle is a little bit difficult to read. So I, I like things that are fun myself, but I think that maybe if we could refine uh, to a little bit more of a simpler font on anything that's outside of the circle because anything, it's a little challenging to read. And I actually have a high definition a copy of this and I will find some technical assistance to get that printed. April? Oh, well, I want to thank Dan for a lot of the work that you've done on this. I've been able to attend the, when we went down to Everett, the chart, which was um, really, I think the, for me, was like, wow, you really can do this and people are doing this and how awesome that would be. But also to see all the people in the room at the chart where I, it was either the sheriff or their chief, chief of police or maybe even both. We're just taking this huge ownership in, in this process. And it was even to a point where, you know, they might be arriving on scene to a call. They already know information about this person, their triggers, things that will happen where they, they might be able to handle in a very trauma-informed way without getting somebody set off, which then brings it to a whole nother. So that was the impetus of me starting to dig in and get more involved in a lot of this stuff. And then um, I was able to attend both of the grace uh, with the mayor and with yourself. and. Um, I would encourage any other council members as we move forward. I know you throw out those invitations, but it, it's so much information and you really get into it. It's, it's really helpful and it's motivating to see all those people in the room committing in that moment. Um, so I'm just, I'm looking forward to digging in a little bit further and I'd appreciate if you keep throwing out those invitations and opportunities to learn more in this process. And I, I do think that uh, that that peace health piece, I was glad to see Chris um, commit is something that I said earlier. We we can show that there is specific benefit. There's a I met with a nurse the other day, a constituent here that said, man, there's this one particular patient and unfortunately has mental illness, is homeless, dealing with homelessness and also has AIDS. And so what happens is he's not taking his medication. So then we have him for six weeks. We get him all better, but we have to send him out when he's healthy. And there's this whole all this money, all this energy, all these resources, that if we were able to help with that, it would be a huge impact, a positive impact on Peace Health. So I hope we will continue to bang that drum. And it sounds like they don't need too much banging, but <laughs> maybe banging is the wrong word. But. 
And I will say that we had great partnership just in putting on the forums, and the hospital did help support the um, presentations as well as the facilitator, as did the city. I have some financial questions, and I don't know, maybe Dan or Kelly might want to deal with this. Um, are, are we looking forward and anticipating what we might do in terms of a budgetary process? Um, it's using largely existing agencies and funding, but there also are some new positions that would need to be created. You've, we've heard that the county is willing to support Peace Health, presumably the city as well. In terms of the budgetary process, where are we on that? How, how premature or ripe is it to start thinking about that? Well, I think, first of all, um, I'm, ex I'm extremely excited that this is a countywide effort. So that's the first thing that thrills me. And, I, and even though I know, Pinky, we can't read it, I haven't seen many charts like this where it has everybody on the same page, so thank you. Um, I think it's, we're going through the request period right now for the, for the new budget, so I think it's probably up to Dan and Tara, um, based on their experience in this group, to talk about if there's other you know, funding that needs to happen. But I think with the addition of what the, the county and the hospital may be willing to do, we, we do put a, a significant investment in the programs that we're doing now, and I think we just need to evaluate where the gaps are um, when everybody else is making those same commitments. But I'd like it to be based on recommendations about outcomes and services and not just put more money into it, because I think that we also have to be smart about the money we invest. Um, just the community paramedic program uh, you know, presentation we had today was very clear that sometimes a lower cost way to do something, you get a better, you get a better result. So. I think that's exactly my point, but with community paramedics and with the numbers that Dan cited, is that it's, there's so much savings just financially by spending, you know, in this forward engaged fashion. So it's morally better the thing to do ethically, professionally, but it's also financially. So I just want to make sure that we don't respond too slowly. We've got some time until the next budget year. This, pro this well, I mean, proposal's not yet finished. I just want us to be ready kind of in sequence. Well, I think right now we're going to be asking our, our department heads for their, and, and you also, for ideas you have. This is midterm budget adjustment. I'm not thinking that we're going to be changing our, our biennial budget by a whole lot. But the money that we invest in these kind of potentially preventative programs that keep people out of jail and out of the hospital, as Anne said, I mean, they're worth every penny and in the, especially in the long term, are going to benefit our community and the individuals. So thank you. Okay, anything else on this? Okay, we'll move on to the next item. Thank you very much, Dean and Ann. Uh, the next item is a discussion of the draft city council communications plan. At our retreat at the beginning of the year, um, the council expressed a desire for a city council communications plan. Uh, myself, as current president, Councilor Pinky Vargas, as past president, uh, volunteered to work with council staff in the development of a plan. A draft of that is presented today in, the, uh, in your packet for consideration. Uh, this is a time for discussion. Uh, identification of um, elements in the plan you think are appropriate or maybe elements maybe are missing. I don't know, Pinky, if you want to say anything um, about the process or your... I just wouldn't mind highlighting a couple of things. Okay. Um, it, one in particular is um, obviously uh, the last couple of years we've had lots of issues that people are wanting more information on and also uh, we want to make the process easier for our residents to be able to find information that we're doing. So one of the things was a creation of a top issues section. Um, and this is to um, have uh, an easy uh, 
an, an, an easy access for people to find. So right on the front page of the City Council website is links to things that are top issues that people want more information on, for example, uh, our jail process, our housing, so that you can actually find clips of the videos of the things that we're discussing on those topics instead of having to search through an entire council meeting to find the subjects that you are particularly interested in. So this is one of the things that I think is a huge step forward in regards to transparency, in regards to communication with residents and access to information. So this is one of my favorite things that came out of this. Um, but also just the reason that we did this plan is part of the feedback we received last year is that people feel that we, uh, the information is not that accessible or we're not sharing it. And what happens is we all are um, very engrossed in doing our jobs and learning the information, but maybe not always sharing all the information that we're receiving or uh, what we're figuring out. So we're hoping through things like the top issues, through more communication through social media, talking about what's our on, on our agenda every two weeks. So it's an easy place for people just go to Facebook and see, oh, what's on the agenda? I know what time to be there. So it makes it easy for people. And that's what we're trying to do is make things a little bit easier and do a better job at communication because we receive lots of um, feedback on communication. So we're trying to step this up and we encourage the public if they have feedback and they're finding, thing, or finding it difficult to understand a process that we're going through, um, that we look at our communication plan and see if there's a way that we can deliver that. So it was just an opportunity for us to increase communication and transparency. Um, and hopefully if you go to our city council uh, website, you'll see how we're laying things out and you'll find there are a lot easier to find. Thanks. Roxanne. Well, I've heard that the <coughs> Bellingham Herald isn't covering our municipal government as much because our stories just don't get clicked on enough. So therein lies a unique opportunity for us to generate our own news and for us to be the trusted source that people will come through. And I also appreciate that we're trying to get more proactive with this because this is what we can do to get more engagement and to get more involvement but also just to be a more trusted source for our community. So I appreciate all the efforts. And, and then I move that we would uh, vote to adopt the draft council communications plan. Second. We have a motion before us to adopt the city council communications plan. I'd just like to comment that this draft has been reviewed by members of the administration. Our legal staff had us beef up a few points that needed uh, beefing up. Um, some outside uh, consultants uh, gave it a look over. Uh, the communication goals there is a set of bullet points. Those were actually developed by the City Council back in 2014 and were incorporated in this document. There's a lot of discussion on the who and the what because with uh, who will be doing the communicating and what they, are they allowed to say. We have a little matrix in there basically about things that are obvious and non-controversial or and also things that are somewhat controversial but there's still some consensus or official city council action or city policy to speak to. We're trying not to have our, our, our the staff uh, who are involved in communications kind of go out of bounds and we've tried to identify what topics are actually out of bounds, areas in which the city council has not reached a determination, areas in which there is no existing city policy. It may be a really hot and important topic, but if there's no guidance, we don't want the staff going, going out into uncharted territory. So we've tried to identify where it is we can communicate and who would be doing the communicating and uh, what the role of the council president would be in overseeing the staff and making sure that as currently as your council president, that the communication effort aligns with the city council's goals that already exist and to identify when there is no alignment and we should just back off. And the future, uh, that role will be taken on by whoever's president next year and the year after. Um, I guess those would be my, uh, my comments. That and as, you, as Pinky pointed out, we've already increased um, our use, a proactive use of the website for more information and our use of social media to kind of direct things in a more immediate fashion. As Roxanne says, the news cycle is, isn't quite what it used to be here in Bellingham. Um, and one of the things we're making sure to do is coordinate our communication with the rest of the city's communication, cross-linking communication efforts on the web so that what the city council is doing is very much you know, joined to the rest of the city's efforts. Uh, Kelly? I think Roxanne probably mentioned my biggest pet peeve, and that is what happens day to day in government is not always sexy and clickable. In fact, sometimes it's just 
educating people on the way you guys do your business, what the city does, just reporting. And I saw this happen at the legislature where we went from a full newsroom right on campus to when there were TV cameras in the chambers, I knew we were going to have a big vote on a bill that was going to be controversial. So I realized the click thing, and I, and I have to admit I'm not the biggest social media person. On the other hand, I like the idea that we coordinate because it's just information to know that when someone doesn't see you at a meeting, it doesn't mean you're not doing something. When someone doesn't see me sit, well, they never see me sitting in my office, but they, it, it, you know, the, the employees of the city, everybody just does stuff all day long. So if we can really let people know what kind of work government work is, maybe we'll encourage a few more people to want to take the plunge and participate either as an employee or an elected official. So anyway, I appreciate your efforts. We have a motion to, and Peter, will we have to, we'll formally adopt this tonight if there's a positive vote. So the recommendation right now, or the vote motion right now is to recommend adopting this this evening. Do we feel ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> okay, I'll bring that forward, a positive recommendation. Michael, tonight. can I just say one more thing yes, about Yes, thank you. Go ahead. So I just wanted to say that I wanted to uh, express thanks to Marie and Mark, um, particularly uh, Marie, who has not only taken on uh, putting together the communication and stepping things up, but also doing training for social media um, to help us as a city be a better communicator. So I just wanted to acknowledge. Thank you, Marie. Yes, indeed. Okay, and we'll go on to the next item, which is the Criminal Justice Committee. Um, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, the uh, City Council uh, voted uh, to form a new uh, Council Committee, the uh, Criminal Justice Committee. We did not at that time uh, point a chair or members to that committee. One of the issues that was brought up is that items which might go to the new Justice Committee formally could have gone to public works, public safety. Some of them might have gone to community development. Um, we'll have to uh, go forward, figure out where certain items will go uh, in the future. Um, right now, I think we need to consider membership and chair. Terry? Before you do that, could you explain what issue this, is, this committee is going to, to deal with? Because the Public Safety Committee does deal with the issues of the court and issues around uh, the uh, police system, law enforcement, those kind of things. So, I, you know, what, what specifically, because I realize this was brought forward uh, for a specific reason, and evidently there are specific issues that. Uh, certain council members want to bring forward and lead that hadn't been brought forward to our committees at all. So I'd like, to, before we vote on what it is, uh, membership, I'd like to know exactly what this committee is going to be considering because I'm, I'm not clear of how what's, it's going to be that doesn't fall within our existing system. So we already voted to have the committee? I know, but so what I is think, it? Well, but what is it so I, we know? Well, would you like to answer the question, no. April, or shall I try? You're welcome to try. I just, so, uh, we're not here to debate if we're yeah. going to have the committee or not. No, so I don't, I, especially somebody that we was so We understand our, our committees as they divide up our workload into what we hope are reasonable mm. bins. As you say, Terry, this mm. one kind of encroaches a little bit on some other committees, mm. but at the center of it will be issues relating to our criminal justice system. For example, the presentation on grace, I think, would have fallen squarely in the middle of this committee as an example of what might be assigned there in the future. Okay, but just, yeah, just so we, you know, we're not getting, our committee is not getting pushed out because that, it feels like when this was done, it was, we didn't want to go to this committee and that's what it feels like. So I need, you know. Chair, may I? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so 
I think that we did this, uh, we didn't know all the details. I totally recognize that, Terry. So we are flushing it out. And I think that part of this process is for us to look at what falls into maybe justice or, you know, and those procedures versus law enforcement. So I think part of this is going to be figuring it out. I, I know I have a few things that are uh, I would like to see come out of it, um, particularly no matter whether the jail vote passes or not, we are going to have to figure out how we're going to have to spend that 25% that is allocated to diversion and alternative programs. So to me, that seemed like a great place to kind of be proactive, look at those things. So that's for me is one thing, but I don't know if we know all the answers because we actually haven't had an opportunity to discuss it, but maybe as a committee and as we go forward, we can figure out what falls in each one and we can do that, to, we can do that together where if you feel strongly that something believes in public safety or versus justice and law enforcement. So I, I think we can still work to resolution on that. But I, okay, I, I understand parts of this, but part of it, I'm just trying to get clarification ab about what it, now you just said justice and law enforcement as, as the same part. And so it's trying to, I, I think I'm, I'm I just trying to get justice, a clarification about what law we're voting enforcement, on. Which is, I'm kind of going one's over here, one's over there. <laughs> I'm not trying to but, uh, uh, what bring I'm, up whether it's appropriate because I, four people voted that it was, but I'm just wanting to know, because there was, it was clearly decided by a couple people that they wanted this, so there must have been a specific issues, and so that's all I was asking. Well, as council president, what I think I will try to do is if, if, if new agenda items come up that fall squarely within the Justice Committee, it will just assign them and I'll just do that on my own. If there are some of these that, I, that are kind of border cases, this is a new committee, I think I would maybe consult um, with maybe the chairs of those two committees, Good. figure out where it would go as kind of a learning process. And if we continue with this committee, hopefully it'll become more and more predictable in the future and there'll be fewer and fewer judgment calls. Does that seem acceptable? Kelly? Yeah, just some technical things. So, of course, staff, right. staff, staffs, committees, and you guys have a lot of committees, and they don't always meet. So, um, if this committee begins now, great. If we're moving forward, though, it might behoove the council to look at all their committees, and Absolutely. and make sure that the rel the relevant committees are broad enough, so that you don't need more than, I guess however many, six, of, six committees? Yeah, we have adjusted our committees in the past. We've had more than six in the past. We've had committees come and go depending on workload. Um, this is an adjustment we're trying out. April? Yeah, I think this is a great precursor to us moving into our reorganization at the beginning of the year. We know that there's this element of criminal justice and this other arm of, of, of like, our judges and, and that whole other part that is um, not, never, not unless there's I guess not overseen by the mayor. It's over. Judge is part of her thing, and she she tells Darlene what to do, and that's a, a whole another place of communication for us. So I think one, um, this committee is going to be a lot of education. So far, I, I know a lot of people have been involved in all the conversations around uh, criminal justice and and judicial reform and all of those things, but we've really left it mostly on Dan's shoulders. He's been going to every single one of these meetings. He's been processing all of this information. And then, you know, we get the culmination of this event. But like planning, we have three people that, three council members that we really hope and trust <laughs> that they're going and diving into those issues and they're becoming little mini experts and they're gonna tell us what they think and then we'll ask our questions. So just like that, we need that within this system. Whether this passes or not, the jail tax or the public safety tax, we need to figure out what is going on, what do we understand, and then when, when budget comes, it's not just the first time we've ever seen Judge Love and she's telling us the state of the court. So a lot of this committee will be a lot of education, much like our planning committees have been lately. So most likely when staff is coming forward or something, I'm, it'll probably end up going into your public safety committee unless we specifically are asking for something. And as far as staff, 
and staff time, I'm sure staff will want to be involved and, and join the process. However, I asked Judge Lev if, if she'd be willing to let us have some of Darlene's time if she had to come over and present. And then I also asked Mark if he had the time to do that, and they both felt that that would be appropriate. So. And just to make it really clear, Darlene participates in our department head yes. meetings. Darlene's mm -hmm. part of our criminal justice team. No, we don't direct Judge Lev. <laughs> she wouldn't probably let us. But That's <laughs> just great. Yeah. But, but th with all the things that have happened in criminal justice, Darlene's been a very active yes. member of our, of our team. So I don't see this committee working a whole lot differently than any of your other mm -hmm. committee's work. I mean, the library... Librarian is hired by the trust board of trustees. I mean, we have a, a lot of things like that. So I guess I wouldn't want to see it become a separate kind of committee off by itself somewhere. Um, so I just was just checking on the workload that you guys all have and whether or not I, I'm happy to hear that there might be an analysis of your what, you know, what exactly the, the point of the committee is so Michael knows where to assign the bills and also some discussion later on about all your committees and you know do they work and I I, I don't know if Terry of criminal justice or um, public safety and public works is that a tr is that because I'm asking because I'm new if that's a traditional is that the way it's just traditional yeah that's been? the way it was brought up yep. years ago yeah it, it is it's been that way for as yeah, long as I've been on the council, it's as long, been probably as, long yeah. as Gene has been on the council. So well, I'd like to move this along because yeah. we have other items. Yeah. Um, the item before us is, would anyone like to uh, nominate themselves or anyone else for uh, the chair of the committee? April? Uh, well, I'd like to nominate Dan and Pinky who have expressed interest and I, I can nominate as, myself. Yes, you can. Okay. I nominate myself as chair since um, I brought it forward and I've already started that relationship with Darlene and Mark on this. Mm. Uh, we need a second for that. Mm. I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion before us to uh, nominate April Barker as chair and then Dan and Pinky as members. We're basically going off the procedures that we normally use once a year when we, at the, when we do the reorg meeting. Terry. I'd like to nominate myself as a member of this committee. Okay. Um, according to our procedures, if there's uh, more than open seats uh, nominated for uh, a position, we have a chance to vote on that individually. Oh gosh, Peter, remind me, do we have to, do I, do we have three people for two positions? So I think during the reorg meeting, I believe you first decide a chair, if I'm okay. not mistaken. And then you determine the other committee members, and each person has a vote for as many positions as are available. Oops. So for that second round, um, each, in, each council member would have two votes for the two positions. Does that sound? That's, that... But you know, we can have a chair. We can have four people on a committee. Um, I think our procedures were revised that we now limit them to three. It used to be that way, I agree, but I think we revise it. Because of quorum issues, we've kept oh, committees to three now. Yes, so that, if there's no objection, correct. I'm going to go ahead and divide the, the vote. The motion will be to uh, nominate uh, April Barker as chair, and I'll, I'll assume there's a second for that. Is there any further discussion on the issue of chair? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of, not, of um, appointing April Barker chair of the Justice Committee signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Passed unanimously. So we have three nominations for two positions. Is there any further discussion that people would like to talk about who would like to be members of those committees? Dan? Um, I, I'm happy to withdraw my um, nomination just to make this a little bit easier. I, I'm um, up to here in justice <laughs> issues. And you're not that tall, so you yeah, right, can't. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to continue my, my service on the Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force and Behavioral Health Subcommittee and do the work that way. Um, perhaps make recommendations or, or work with the committee, the Justice Committee, um, in that capacity if I'm fine with that. Any objections to the withdrawal of the nomination? Are you suggesting withdrawal or completely withdrawing? My, my, my hope in this would be that we would be taking some of that weight off of your shoulders and that there would be a, a really appropriate place for you to come back and report where it doesn't take the whole council's time and that you could, we could be also shouldering that and showing up at meetings, whatever you need. But then coming back, bringing that information and working with 
Judge Lev and all those. So I think you would be a critical piece of it, and it's actually one of the reasons why I was even thinking that it would be <laughs> instrumental, having gone to some of those meetings with you and seeing how much of that you're taking on. Um, I'm, I'm fine with um, being a, um, ex officio or whatever the <laughs> external actor would be um, um, to this committee. I, still I, be coming. I would probably still attend meetings and yeah. um, and be a part of it. I, it, just by way of the the work that's done on the task force. Yeah. So, okay, right now Dan is nominated. Uh, he doesn't have the power to pull himself off. But are there any objections to withdrawing his nomination? Seeing no objections, his nomination withdrawn. We now have two yeah. nominations. We'll go forward to the voice vote to appoint Pinky and. Terry to uh, the committee. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Pinky and Terry are committee members of the new Justice Committee, chaired by Council Member Barker. Thank you. Uh, fifth item update on pilot projects for inquiries, reports, and complaints to the city. The administration has been asked and will discuss a draft scope of work for a pilot project for community members to make inquiries, reports, and complaints who may not feel safe or acknowledged if they try to utilize more traditional forms and formats of reporting to the city. This is part of kind of a transparency and accountability piece that the uh, city council has been uh, asking for. Um, Mr. Heinrich, are you going to take this? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that this, Brian's you know, been taking the lead on this, and we're, we don't have all the details worked out. What this basically is, is an opportunity for the Dispute Resolution Center to come up with a, a draft of a pilot proposal. So it's not the de we don't have the details yet. And it's the safe harbor idea that I'm very committed to. Brian. Brent Heinrich, Mayor's Office. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to read the memorandum from the Wacom Dispute Resolution Center that's in your packet. Uh, this was based on a handful of conversations that the mayor and I had with Moonwater. Uh, as the mayor said, we asked them to help us develop a process. Um, you'll see that the six steps uh, all work in tandem uh, leading up to the, the, final, um, uh, the final step, which is a report that will summarize interview data that they've gathered uh, and what some of those service options might be. That ultimate uh, it is, I should say, it will not be a recommendation. It will be a determination uh, that I believe the mayor will make at that time in terms of what is the next phase based on those reports, what makes sense. I anticipate we would be back um, in front of council in a couple months uh, on, on that next phase. But you'll see, uh, hopefully, uh, you saw that uh, we anticipate it will be about two months before this is uh, completed. Uh, we are just checking in based on council interest. Uh, we do not have a contract, but that should uh, move along pretty quickly um, following today. Dan? Just, um, question on the last paragraph on page 108 of the packet. It covered, it talks about the costs, and it looks like it's between $5,250 and $7,000. Is that per incident? Per no, no. So the, that cost is to uh, develop the service options. So remember what oh, we're asking DRC to do is help us interview, come up with what some service options, options might look like, <laughs> analyze some data, and then give us, um, as, is, as is identified in here, three to five different options. So it's not per incident. In fact, uh, I want to be clear, we are not working with DRC to be the service provider. We're, we're working with them to help us develop those options. And we're, and we're just paying for it out of the mayor's office. So we've covered the cost. Dan? Is there, is there a current operating um, law and justice civilian commission that works, and maybe Chief Cook's here, I don't know who the appropriate person to ask it. Well, the, the chief has his advisory committee that, that he runs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I don't think we have something um, separate that's a governmental entity. Do you, I don't think so. So the origin of this in, in part had to do with uh, sometimes uh, some of our public employees may misbehave and the public should be able to complain about 
that misbehavior. Uh, if it deals with the police, the complaint can be very serious, but it can be equally serious if it's any other member of this city. And so what we're trying to do is uh, make sure that if there are complaints that we hear them and that we don't not hear them because we haven't provided a safe and non-traditional way of making a complaint as well as alongside the traditional maze making complaint. Um, I believe that the, what the administration is considering is we, we have already in place established mechanisms of um, disciplining city employees and this wouldn't replace those existing disciplinary mechanisms but it might provide an alternative way for those to be triggered so that someone who might need to be held accountable would be held accountable. Is that a oh, fair summary? And, and for me, um, Brian has a comment too, for me it's more the incidences of, of when we might need to use this may not be often because obviously most people come and raise their complaint with a department head or a council member or myself or whoever. Um, and I think that one of the issues <clears throat> for Moonwater was also making sure that we've narrowed the scope. So this isn't about I don't like my electric bill and somebody was rude to me. This has nothing to do with that. It was more as a result of other conversations we were having. Um, so we were talking about, and this will come out, is lim not making it just police. That was very clear. I, I was not in favor of that. But also not making it any complaint that possibly could come up in the city. Um, so it was more just a safe place for people who may, maybe were concerned about discrimination or something that was something a, a little more um, involved. or And it could be with any department. It doesn't have to just be um, obviously not just with police or fire or, or anything like that, but these are what, this is what uh, Moonwater said she'd like to have some opportunity to work through because it would be a, a very large um, endeavor to create a separate agency where, you know, where all complaints, you know, would be funneled. So it gives us a chance to talk about it. We don't have to decide that today. So there'll be options. But, Brian, I covered it, you said. Dan, you had your hand up? Um, I guess my concern was having a, um, a method or a you call it safe harbor um, in terms of how a person, if they felt discriminated against, for example, that, that's kind of, that would be my threshold. It's not the, the electric bill that I, no. I don't want to pay or think it's too high. It's more about if a, any city employee, parks or whatever the, I don't mean to pick on parks, but and whatever, the, the department is is that there's an avenue or a channel for that person to come forward in a in, in a way that they felt safe and there weren't there wouldn't be a, any kind of um, I don't know what's the right word recrimination or any kind of um, repercussions. Yeah, um, and, and so, I think that's what I was saying. Is it, it it's yeah it's more on a discrimination something like that, but also people also don't have to go there. So it isn't like this is the this is how you make that complaint. This is if they feel comfortable talking to me or they feel comfortable talking to one of you and you pass that on to me, then we can deal with it internally too. It's not all an external kind of thing. And that's why um, I, I think it's important to have. I don't think that it would be used often because we usually deal with this, but if it is, I mean, and just to use our police department as a example, when things go wrong in our police department, we have the kind of chief that confronts them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess it would be, you know, for that, those ca unusual cases where that didn't happen. But we're going to hear from Moonwater what she thinks. Terry? So I would still like to solve most things mm -hmm. internally if we can, but when we can't, people need a safe place to go. Terry? Yeah, I really like that idea of that this is a limited kind of scope with it for those because we have heard that some people may be uh, afraid to come forward to bring it forward to in an official to somebody in an official capacity and if that is the case and we don't know if it's the case or not the case we've just heard you know uh, some stories that, that that may or may not be true, but if it is, then this would be the kind of thing 
for it, because I, I do think we have processes generally to deal with most of the problems, you know. This, I know I've had a number of people at different times over the years, they've got a problem, they bring it forward, we try to resolve it through whatever. I know the mayor's office has the police chief, whatever. We've been able to do that, for, but if there are people that are concerned about talking to someone, then they should have an option, and if we can develop that option, if Moonwater can help us develop that option, and I think it's a good idea to have someone like Dispute Resolute, because then no one can point the finger and say, see, you're just setting this up, you know, uh, to protect yourself or do whatever, you know. So I think this is a, a good way to do it, and to limit the scope, I think, is a really good idea. So this is for information only. I think we've done two good clarifications. One, uh, when this has come back, it, I think it'll be important to highlight the, the current disciplinary mechanisms that are already in place and to indicate this is for cases of discrimination or maybe violations of civil rights or serious misconduct when the person doesn't feel safe using the existing means of reporting uh, to initiate, you know, investigation and possible disciplinary action. We were thinking it would be limited to high-level kinds of incidences. Okay. Any further discussion on this? Okay. I believe that is the last of our scheduled items. And now we need to find the next piece of paper. Minutes for approval. We have a rather large set of minutes from July 10th. Move approval. approval. Second. We have a motion for us to approve the minutes for July 10th committee, committee meetings. Are there any changes or corrections needed? All those in favor of approval signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, items that are old and new business. I will start off with a brief announcement that the City Council offices will actually be closed in a few days. Uh, July 27th through 31st, staff will be out on well-deserved vacations and no one will be in the office for those, that brief Where period. Where am I going to come and hang out? Um, you can still email us. I can get in. I can, I'll man it. Any other items for old and new? <laughs> Dan. Uh, I wanted to thank the mayor. Um, and Council Members Vargas and Barker, uh, County Council Member uh, Brown, um, School Board Director uh, Bashaw, who, full disclosure, she's my wife, uh, for, <laughs> for, uh, to, for volunteering alongside 175 other volunteers at Project Homeless Connect on Friday. We served 515 people. It's down 5% from the previous year. Um, we did see an, a rise in unsheltered um, individuals that, were, that attended and received services at the event. But uh, overall, I'd say it was quite successful, and uh, we helped a lot of folks that day. So I just want to acknowledge those volunteers. Thank you. Thank you. April. So we, I had brought up a new and old business after we had our planning committee last time on rental barriers and concerns to have the Opportunity Council come and present to us at an evening meeting on their master leasing program as one of our other prongs of getting people to understand they can participate in the master leasing program. My understanding from Michael is that if it's longer than 15 minutes, we need to get approval for council in the evening meeting. And so Adrian was thinking she, because of the real lull in having veterans housing as well and some of the complexities with that, she wanted to highlight that um, in that opportunity of talking to us and the public so thinking it will be over 15 minutes possibly 2025 so I before we scheduled it I just wanted to make sure that it was okay with council it was, yeah. so it would be like a presentation at an evening meeting right yeah, yeah it's longer yeah, than fine. any traditional presentation I wanted to make sure that there was no problem yeah no action it. will be taken <laughs> no, no action. Yeah. okay Thank no you. objection we'll go ahead and schedule that a little longer than usual okay. pinky uh, two quick things. One, I wanted to thank Councilmember Dan Hamill for his work on Project Homeless Connect. I thought it was a, uh, it's been stepped up every year and I thought it operated incredibly smoothly and it was a really fantastic day. So thank you for that. Um, and also I serve on the tourism um, board and one of the things that we have that's out there for people in the community is we have tourism grants and our tourism grants cycle is open now and we, we uh, the deadline to get them submitted is September 8th, 2017. These are for grants for 2018. Uh, we have two different kinds of grants and just parameters is is this is to increase economic activity by bringing tourism to Bellingham. So this could be an event, it could be art. Uh, there are lots of things that fall into that parameter. We have two different kinds of grants. One of them is our um, 
easy entry grants, they are $5,000 and they include money for operation and materials. Um, and then we have another set of grants that start at $2,500 up to $25,000. So we're really hoping to open this up as much as possible um, and invite as many applicants as possible. So I encourage everyone here to spread this message about our grants and that availability. And maybe Marie, you could put that information on our website and I'll send you the link for the application. That's all I have. Thank you. Anything else under old and new? I'll, I'll make this very brief. I know we're running we're, we're way over. I just want to c counsel the um, know that I went to Smoky Point Behavioral Hospital grand opening. Uh, it was last week. Um, it's a 115 bed facility. We know that Pioneer Center North 141 bed facility is closing. This new facility is opening and there's a, obviously that gap in between there. They do have an involuntary commitment um, ward, I guess. Um, but I did want just want to make sure that the council was aware of that resource. Uh, it will be available to Whatcom County and Bellingham residents. Okay, we'll now go to uh, Peter. Executive so session. in the interest of time, if it's the council's desire, we can postpone number four. I know there's an addition on the executive okay, session. Okay, so we had originally four executive session items. We added a fifth. Uh, are you saying that number four on there, we c it's a longer one, 20 minutes. We could postpone that item. So we still will have four uh, executive session items. We're going to recess and then I'll come back in approximately. Let me do the math. I think I'll come back in 40 minutes from now. Yeah, in